Freaky Finance here. I took a couple weeks off, started going to the gym again. Getting back into the swing of things, you can see uh, Christmas has uh, started to happen here with decorations anyway. <laughs> anyway, today we're going to take a look at the theme that I've started going with. And I, I'm going to do a 2022 video like I did for 2021 where we kind of talked about reflation and that gas. When I'll reflect on what 2021 was and then we'll see what 2022 is likely to be, in my view. One of the themes that I'm thinking is a return to the service spending, right, as people reopen. For today, we're going to look at physical therapy play, so services. Really, if I had to sum up the thinking here, it's just people are going to be more mobile in 2022 versus 2021 and 2020. And this also fits a bill of something that I've seen lately, and that's a broken SPAC. So this was a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition vehicle, that got busted. What I mean by that, it's just so basically the SPAC's coming out at 10 bucks. And then as soon as it lists, it just gets destroyed. And so this thing got destroyed. Now it got destroyed for a reason, and we're going to go into it. And it's a pretty interesting reason. And I do own this one, and it's a dicier, dicier position. So with that preamble in mind, let's get into it. So like I said, physical therapy. Again, main thinking, more people moving. equals more demand for physical therapy. And this is likely the type of service that people would have put off during COVID, right? You don't want to be near somebody during a pandemic I mean, you're also not moving around as much and so i think people's flexibility has probably weakened during covid that's, that's one angle anyway right and there's probably a built-up demand case to be made there the company itself is called ati physical therapy it's a, i think it's the biggest physical therapy provider it's very fragmented market and they are in quite a few states at the time of so <laughs> this is fun so they have a presentation that was when they were going to SPAC so they're going to go through the presentation of what they promised during the SPAC and what's actually happened to the company since the SPAC and there is a disconnect there and that's why the market has punished these guys so hardly so anyway so take all these estimates that they have on their presentation as estimates and these estimates did not happen in 2021 anyway probably unlikely to happen in 2022 <laughs> but if, if they does happen it'll be very good for the investment but um basically the company over promised and under delivered for 2021 at least in my eyes so they have a fairly diversified per, uh, footprint it says 882 clinics they actually have 900 now and they continue to grow linearly each quarter so that number cons consistently goes up so they are still in growth mode and their payer mix, very much commercial and government focused with a little bit of workers' comp. Workers' comp actually went down in uh, 2020 and 2021 as a part of their business as a percent. So, And that's kind of what we expect. And more people going back to work should lead to more workers' comp demand. This company, just to show kind of what I'm thinking with it, is so basically it's a SPAC. So tight range of this 10 bucks because that's what the cash is worth. And then during the hype phase of SPACs, if you remember, it was like all the rage in early 2021, probably around this time. In December 2020, all these SPACs started drifting to a premium to their <laughs> cash value. And some of these SPACs didn't even say what they're buying yet. <laughs> That's how crazy it was. So anyway, you had this SPAC trading almost up 28%, even though it hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> so then it says they're going to buy this company. And the thinking here is pretty steady. Um, basically, they're going to delever the company using the SPAC's proceeds, and repair the balance sheet, and further accelerate growth is the idea and to uh tuck in a fragmented industry so on the surface the strategy makes sense of why they picked this company to uh, acquire take public through its back so anyway it goes around 10 bucks 10 bucks more funds get into it and then right when the uh <laughs> when it despacks you can see oh and uh the number of funds holding is the red line that will report on a leg right because they only report that each quarter so you can see as soon as this thing despack a whole lot of people funds sold and then so far, they're still held, which is interesting. So, but it definitely shook out quite a few funds right away after the D SPAC. Because you got to remember, back then the SPACs were hot. As long as they put money in the SPAC, they're going to make money, right? That was the lazy thinking, and it backfired. Now, it backfired for an interesting reason for this company, in that the EBITDA has gone down dramatically. Originally, people that were getting into this company are probably thinking that it was going to rebound from COVID, and while well, some of the demand rebounded from COVID, it wasn't exactly linear, and the company also did something very important in that they uh, foreloaded a lot of staff during when the demand got weak, and then they were unable to pick them up as the attrition was still very high. So they actually had a shortage of workers, <laughs> and they weren't able to uh, execute on their plan, even though they're still paying rent and all that, right, for all these clinics. So it was an interesting time. We'll go through the numbers. 
So anyway, Advent. This the history of this company is very interesting. <laughs> it's basically been bouncing around in private equity for years. So basically, one private equity fund will buy it from another private equity fund. All this bouncing back and forth between each other, and the whole time the company is growing as clinics. So anyway, Advent bought majority stake physical therapy and from KRG in 2016. Uh, some news sources say 1.9 billion was the value that they took it at. This will be important later when we go through the numbers. Um, I did find this on page 143 of the prospectus, and this also references the 1.9 billion dollar number. We'll co-acquired all of the outstanding shares, the WTI acquisition holdings for 1.9 billion. So that kind of reiterates the value that the company was approximately worth at that time in 2016. For reference, I, I believe the clinics at that time were about 500. The EBITDA was still around 100 million, I think, for the company. So it's trading basically about 19 times, which might be a little bit steep for private equity, but we'll, for, but the company is growing, so it's hard to value that. But anyway, I'm kind of rambling there, but all I'm trying to say here is that at one point, this company is worth $1.9 billion. I'm going to go through the SPAC first, so the SPAC presentation, so what got people into it at 10 bucks. And why I'm getting into it now at three bucks and fifty cents, right? Sixty-five percent off. This company basically says we're gonna go public. Our valuation is attractive. We're only at fourteen times um, EBITDA, and basically the industry is around twenty times EBITDA, twenty-one times EBITDA. So basically they're saying we're gonna come in fairly cheap valuation for everybody, <laughs> and they're gonna use the proceeds. That's the most important part to pay down debt because debt is actually pretty high for this company going into it. And then we'll look at that because I have twenty nineteen numbers too. I was able to dig those out. Basically, reduce the balance sheet debt, so repair it. You can see that here, deleveraging from almost six times to under three times, which is far superior, right? And they probably use the cash to accelerate growth. So here, it says sources and use, really. Well, you can really infer from this page that they're paying down debt. So this slide is probably my favorite of the SPAC presentation. <laughs> you can see here, COVID did the company no favors in 2020 in terms of revenue and in terms of EBITDA. This is interesting. So <laughs> the gray area here. Do you remember they're trying to do a SPAC, so they're trying to release the stock into the market, and they need a good story. Anyway, they add back quite a bit from CARES and rent relief and all this that they were getting, basically saying this is what our EBITDA could have been. <laughs> Real, it was 64, so basically got halved during COVID, which is what you'd expect. And we'll go through the numbers in more detail in a bit, but you can see basically they're saying they're going to go organically 10% a year every year, and that doesn't include M&A, which is... What they've been doing over the last really 10 years is slowly acquiring other smaller players in the industry because it is very fragmented. Anyway, I want to just point out here 119 million was their estimate 2021. And importantly, this presentation is dated May 2021. And this company is under SEC investigation now. And I think one of the reasons why is they're going to be like, as of May, you're saying you're able to do 119 million estimated for 2021 but you knew of these issues that were going on in the company, right? Or that's what they're going to say. And then we know at the end of July, so less than, I don't know, two months after this presentation was put together, they slashed the EBITDA from 119 million to something like 66 million, 70 million. And then they slashed it again to 44 million in Q3. So anyway, this company is probably going to put up only actual <laughs> results may differ. The set of 119 million that they had on this 2021 presentation slide for May, they're now only guiding to about 44 million from 42 million for uh, 2021 actual now. <laughs> and you can see the share price got destroyed, right? Going from 10 to basically 65% off. I do own this one. So yeah, it closed yesterday at 362. You can see during the SPAC hype, this thing actually traded up 30% versus what the cash was worth. And now the balloon is out of the uh, SPAC bubble. Or the balloons burst rather. And you can see the SPAC is trading fairly, fairly cheaply. Though, again, with a reason. They literally said the company's going to do 119 million. Realistically, they're doing 44 million, which is worse than the COVID year with the shutdowns, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. So you can see why this thing is so cheap. Again, this is on their presentation for the SPAC. They're arguing that they're undervalued versus peers. This is probably true. Generally, private equity has lower multiples, so when you unleash it on the market, generally, you're going to appreciate in value over time, or at least that's the general thinking. This slide just references the fragmentation of the industry. You can see local and regional operators are still a huge part of the industry. ATI is one of the bigger ones. You have Select and USPH in there. And you can see what their M&A upside supported by history of success. So basically, they acquire somebody, and then they get these synergies out of it. Two years out, they get quite a bit of cost out of that whatever they acquire. 
It's General Tufkin's strategy. Um, and it does appear to have worked for them over time, so we don't necessarily know that. It's only two years here of data. Then these numbers check out, or at least 2019 does. I didn't check 2018, but 2020, again, here on this slide, they say 155. <laughs> But we know that really they only did 64 of the actual operations. And here they're, yeah, they're just assuming they're going to get their 10% a year and their multiple is going to go to 20%. And to be fair, I was slowly reaching that number based on the number of visits per clinic. And we'll talk about that metric in a bit because that's going to be important to the investment thesis and why I'm in it now. Though again, there's lots of hair on this investment uh, sponsor from other shares. So they do have some earnouts here. So again, right now, I don't know how motivated you are when the share price is at 360 and your earnouts are at 12, 14, 16. So technically management is incentivized to get the share price up. So at this point, it's got to be a little demoralizing when it's backfired so hard on you. This is just another way they're trying to show that they're undervalued. Basically, they're saying we're cheaper than the rest and we're growing faster than the rest. We'll have to see if that's true or not. They are definitely cheaper right now if they can do what they used to do. Based on their current really bad numbers, they're not great. If they can get their EBITDA back up to just what they were in 2018 and 2019, then this company looks pretty attractive at these prices. Um, this was the CEO. SPAC was public, I want to say middle of June, and he's let go August 9th, so what's that, less than three months? So yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty short short time horizon for a CEO, lasted one quarter. <laughs> so this is, so they promise all this stuff, and then you look at their Indeed, and you can see a whole lot of one stars, a lot of these, importantly, are in a certain time period. More references to numbers in a bit. But you can see here, December, one star, management horrible, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's being let go. Um, they only care about the numbers, underpay, overwork. And again, this is, so they laid off a lot of people in March um, during when the COVID shut down, right? Traffic shuts down, they react. What's likely is that man was starting to pick back up and these guys were just like getting overworked because they weren't hiring people in pace with the uh, recovery. That's what it looks like here. And there's a lot of trash talk one stars in this 2020 period. Importantly, it stopped, which is a good thing. Um, Glassdoor, the more recent ones, and they're all kind of, I don't know if they're <laughs> fake or not, but they definitely all, lately, they've been better as of 2021. This was the Q2 conference call, and this is when they dropped their guidance from, uh... <laughs> and you got to remember that presentation was at the, uh, I want to say the middle of May, end of May, and as of their earnings forecast, First quarter out public company, they slashed their revenue from their 731, 119 million that was on that <laughs> estimated 2021 presentation just a couple months ago, and they slash it. Not and not to buy a small amount, that's almost half. Right, they bring it down to 16 million. And so that, that's pretty crazy. There's definitely an angle here. Like I said, this company's under SEC investigation. Would it not be public knowledge for people to know that you're going to? unleash this on the market <laughs> even though you obviously based on what i can see from the job description you can see it turn and the numbers that we saw and we'll go through the churn it's very high turnover <laughs> so there's definitely a mass exodus during 2020 that probably should have been brought up to investors attention and definitely at least guided to in the numbers <laughs> there's some some statements somewhere anyway he was let go august 9th like i said less than three months tenure for the new ceo they're still looking for a ceo a new ceo q3 was good so that's why i got into it is, um, and that's why the share price has also kind of bounced a bit. We'll see if that sticks or not, because Q4 won't be great for the company, though they've already guided that it's going to be another crap quarter. Larson guy, if you listen to the latest call, it's actually he's actually pretty good about it. He's trying to do some damage control, obviously, because this is a busted spec. Ultimately, these type of plays are riskier, but you are getting quite the discount. Like I said, 65% off. Is the business um, currently struggling? Yes. Still even a positive. <laughs> but, uh... Definitely a former shadow of itself. Here's the SEC saying on October 5th, or sorry, November 5th, they asked for documents regarding July's 26 earnings projection. <clears throat> anyway, let's jump to the numbers real quick here. They actually have a supplemental tables, which is very interesting. You can see here they actually have these 2019 numbers. And you can see the company is actually turning out pretty good EBITDA in 2019. And this number checks out to their prospectus and all that and their actual results for 2019 <laughs> that's always good and you can see it, and that's on the small amount of added up you had 128 million just to be a bit for 2019 and you can see covid so q2 right here you can see instead of going say in this 25 to 40 million a quarter range for ebitda you go down to 1.1 million in EBITDA. so this company got destroyed during the shutdowns and then down here so i can see okay if the company got destroyed you can see this clinical full-time employee pretty much getting halved 
right? So they stopped hiring in Q2, and then in Q3, they let go of a lot of people. You can see 82% annualized clinician turnover rate. So basically, they see the lack of demand in Q2, and then they react by getting rid of a lot of people in Q3. And that kind of echoes what we saw in those Indeed during that time period. So anyway, they got rid of a lot of people, so that brings the FTE for clinical um, back up from 1.4 back into the twos anyway, but it's still not close to what it used to be. You can see clinic count continues to rise, which is going to be good in the long run. <laughs> but honestly, right now it's still scary because they're still expanding when their existing operations aren't great. Here's the main point and why I'm in it. And really, it's the primary reason to be in it. As you can see here, in 2019, they're doing about 30 visits per day per clinic. And you can see the EBITDA is pretty good. But you can see in this 20 range, <laughs> in the 15 range, in the really, when the world shut down in Q2, you can see the EBITDA is very bad. Well, relatively bad. I mean, it's still positive, but it's, you can see the business is not what it used to be at 23 visits per day. This is the guidance saying now they're only going to be able to do 40 to 44 million in adjusted EBITDA. And you got to remember, just in May, <laughs> they were saying they'd be able to do 119 million in EBITDA. So <laughs> it's pretty crazy. This is probably, this is right on the, the Q3 call in the transcript. Basically what they're saying here is if we could get our the same performance, same expenses, everything the same, but we could get our visits back to 30 visits per day versus the 23 they're currently at, they'd be able to each out or echo 29 million in EBITDA in that quarter. Importantly, if they're able to, their, their rates are also going down. And part of that is, it's kind of mixed partially sales mix and partially geographic of where things are reopening quicker. But uh, if they got the rate back to 110 versus the 105 they're charging now, they'd also be able to uh, say, controlling for that, they get about 37 million in the quarter in EBITDA. Is the company impaired permanently is what you really have to ask yourself. So management reacted to this slowdown in demand, but they didn't have a plan for getting them back when the demand picked back up. And they obviously mishandled HR because they didn't have a plan. Yes, you're supposed to react to a slowdown, but how do you react to the slowdown, right? I think that was the issue here. So that's a good case. I'm going to look at this video a few years out. I know I don't want to go back. Remember that company that laid off everybody and couldn't hire them back? <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting, fascinating story anyway. Financials themselves, I have 2019 full year, and I have the Q3's year to date. So they're not exactly apples to apples, but you can see the trend. The company is actually pretty good in 2019. You notice the earnings, the bottom line's never great because the company was turning out over 128 million in adjusted even in 2019 right part of that is interest expense was very high for the company again this company was privately owned so the private equity firms were paying themselves quite well for great money for this company you can see rent got cheap salaries got cheaper we laid off people because the man so down during covid friends recently picked back up they have started to hire more so i'm expecting q4 to actually have pretty high um salaries in an effort to get the business back to visits per day over 30 or to 30 again. So Q4 I don't think is going to be great for the company either. So probably time on this one to watch. But I mean, given it's already 65% off, it's, it's it's an interesting, that's why I'm doing a video today. It's, it's a hard judgment call. But yeah, obviously the risk is high and the return to possibility is high if they can get back to what they used to be. One of the things I like is that the SPAC did its job. So you can see here the interest expense. Down material, again, this is three months or three quarters versus a full year. You can see right here, total indebtedness. So the balance sheet item, items right here. You can see total indebtedness going from almost a billion bucks down to 553 million. So they did use the SPAC proceeds to pay down debt and paying down debt helps interest expense. So that'll be good in future years. But for right now, <laughs> it uh, doesn't really matter when the underlying business fundamentals are still so screwed up. So goodwill impairment, business is suffering, the impaired balance sheet the balance sheet you can see intangible assets are quite huge two billion dollars in intangible assets so this company's growing by acquisition they claim their 10 percent organic growth but i mean when you have two billion on the balance sheet and only like let's call it 500 million in, uh, actual physical assets and that includes right of use assets which isn't true either but uh anyway you get an idea that the balance sheet in terms of assets isn't great and you can see the right down here of 900 and 62 million dollars in goodwill ultimately if you're going to have a bad year you're going to do impairments impairments basically just kitchen sink the year you're not going to get any payouts anyway from a management point of view right and get ready for next year clinics just in general keeps climbing up visits per day 
this is the metric that we need in order for this investment to work. You need visits per day per clinic to go up. Right now they're only at 23. They need to get back to 30. And their rates also need to go back up. I have a feeling salaries per visit is going to go back up to get morale back up for the company. A lot of hair on this investment. But at the same time, you've got a company that used to be worth $2.5 billion, maybe what, two, or sorry, $2.5 billion, maybe $2.7 billion. Now it's worth only $1.3 billion. And the balance sheet has improved because of the SPAC. <laughs> Basically on the, the back of investor's capital, it's improved. <laughs> And yeah, we need to get the rent for rev back up, mainly because revenue's still down. Not that rent's been going up that much. But yeah, this it's interesting that companies still linearly expanding, even though their underlying existing operations are so weak. You would kind of maybe like freeze that and <laughs> manage your existing assets better. Or they could be trying to grow during COVID, right? If they're struggling, chances are other physicians were struggling during COVID. So they're trying to pick them up while they're still not fully recovered. That could be the strategy as well. But yeah, they need to get the revenue for clinic back up. The trend's favorably going up, but it's still a shadow of what it used to be. And you can see the annual adjusted even to the shadow that it used to be. And while the company got halved, more than halved in terms of equity value, EV for their current EBITDA is still fairly expensive. If they're able to get there, right here, you can see it. If they're able to get their target, which was 200 million in adjusted EBITDA, they're only at 6.6 .6 times, which is pretty good because the industry is about 20. Right, so that's about a 3x. If it can just get back to its uh, 130 million that it started 2019 with, or ended 2019 with, only at 10 times, so that's an easy double, right, to the industry. That doesn't assume future growth because the clinics have grown over time, right? So you can see that here. So if they can, yeah, I, really the investment thesis, if I had to lay it on something, it would just be getting visits per day per clinic to 30. <laughs> while not totally breaking the bank on increasing salaries to get your employees back that you've pissed off. But yeah, it's an interesting time. Like I said, they got the SEC investigation now. They got looking for a new CEO now. Broken SPAC, Advent. This is an interesting transaction on November 24th, so a little bit more recent. Suppose 127, that's what it shows up here. But the thing is, when I go through the actual details on the footnote, it's really just one company giving shares to another company for no consideration. So these guys are probably affiliated with each other, Wilco and Advent. You can see, note four, they still have 115 million shares of the company, Advent does. But the thing is, they have them between, you can see here, they go start from I, and they go all the way down to XIX, so 19. So they have 19 different, technically, corporations that hold this company in different share amounts. And this is weird, too. Like, I don't know what this means, if anything, but it's just weird. This whole thing is kind of weird. But it's going to be fun to look back and see see what happens. So I almost forgot, just for the last Q3 call, we speak to the attrition, how the trend is going, and it's kind of gave me more confidence. It sounds like they're finally be on top of things. We revisited many of our workplace policies and compensation issues put into place during COVID. They likely reduced pay and cut people, which overworked the remaining people that were there, which in turn increased them wanting to leave during COVID, right? Led to clinical dissatisfaction. So obviously they're aware of the problem. <laughs> they're trying to fix it. You can see the headcount turnover decreased from 50 in the month of July to just over 30% in September. Clinical full-time employees increased by 91. This past July through September, they reduced attrition and picked up a hiring with approximately two completions hired for every departure, both in August and well September, so that's good. And they said that's extended through October and early November as well. It kind of caveats that. So we'll have to see if they're still getting their hiring on point for Q4. I, I have a feeling they will, which will add to expenses in Q4, but likely help them in Q or 2022 next year. It's going to be required, right? They actually want to get those clinic visits per clinic up to 30. Um, they do talk about the rates here. Now they say, when compared to prior years, Paramix shifted from higher paying workers comp and auto personal injury to commercial and governmental. So they're saying they make less on commercial and governmental. They make more on workers comp and auto personal injury. So that, that, that helps me because I wasn't sure what I did the number. But notes right why the rate was only 105 in q3 this year we should see that come back with the reopening so we'll get uh, an increase in rates with an increase in demand or at least that's what i'm thinking again this also assumes that COVID is behind us right they did say their sg in the third quarter was 18 percent higher and this is mainly due to one-time transaction costs consulting costs and insurance costs under the public company so, now they do say that's one time so i'll see if that's true or not next year but yeah i got a feeling 2022, it's going to be hard for this company to do worse than what they did in 2021. <laughs> so, 
you don't know that, maybe they really can't get people back to work for them. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting time to be an investor in this company. So hope you guys like this one. It's a little bit of digging. Like I said, it used to be valued at $1.9 billion in 2016. Currently, I got an EV of $1.3 billion. So $600 million cheaper than what it was worth in 2016. But now it's almost 2022. Uh, the clinics continue to expand. Again, the main thesis is getting the visits per clinic per day back up to uh, get leverage off the uh, fixed asset base. But I'd like to know your thoughts. It's uh, definitely going to be a turnaround story for this company. The CEO who, who they picked for this company is going to have his hands, his or her hands full for 2022. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, have a, have a great rest of your weekend.